And welcome back to the show, everyone. My name is Brian Elam. I will be your host here on Get Your Entrepreneurship Together. And today we have a very special guest. It's another Brian. You can't go wrong with another Brian. And it's Brian Andreco. And you're going to like what this man has to say. He has one, he's one of those guys that's been there and done it all, or at least all in business, went through business school went through coaching, is, a, is an author, has courses. I mean, this guy has the skills to help you level up, not only personally, but professionally as well. So without further ado, Brian, thank you so much for coming on. We are happy to have you. Yeah, Brian, pleasure, man. Excited for the opportunity and uh, always nice to chat with another Brian. <laughs> right, right. And you spell it right too. It's Brian I and I. You know, we, that's a, that's a whole nother debate. We, you know, <laughs> yeah, the, those brides with a Y, man, you gotta, you gotta kind of watch out for them, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, man, like I said, in the open, obviously you're deep in the business world. You have a love for it. And what I was wondering is where did that love for business come from? Did you always have that? Or was that something that, um, you kind of latched onto maybe a little bit later in life? You know, it's funny, you know, and, and reading back some of the stuff there, just listening in as you're kind of introing it, it's kind of funny because for most of my life, I, I, w I was in the background. I played small ball. I was, you know, I don't know if it was partly upbringing, like being a middle child, um, you know, always feeling like I needed to get attention and I was very needy. I learned, you know, it, later in life, I learned that. And so there was a lot of things where I almost was scared to do things. I had a lot of fear. So it's funny reading that stuff back. A lot of the, you know, quote unquote accomplishments, just the really things I've done have all been in the last, let's say, dozen years, actually probably less than that. And what's funny is, no, I don't think I've never, never really had this idea of like, you know, wanting to have a business or entrepreneurship. Heck, I didn't even hear the word entrepreneurship until Honestly, it was probably 2011, I think. You know, Gary V, I saw his Inc. 500, uh, Inc. 500 keynote back in 2011. It was one of the game changers for me, uh, which is a, which is a cool story. But yeah, nonetheless, it, it was uh, yeah, it was it was later in life, and I'm 41, just to kind of put a, a bow around kind of age. So it was really right around maybe late 20s or in the early part of my 30s where I started to have this itch of like, wait, there's something there's something more here. I want to do more. But here's the funny thing, and I'm curious if, if you maybe had a similar epiphany. I actually, before that, you know, I went to business school, as you said, and I, my first career was actually as a golf professional. So I was a PJ professional. I don't know, are you a golfer at all? You know, it's something that I want to get into. I actually watch it on TV and I find it, I don't know, may, maybe you will agree with this since you're into it, but I find it just very relaxing to watch. Like I just zone out and feel good when I watch it. I don't yeah. know. It's maybe it's weird, but it's definitely something I want to get into. No, it's relaxing until you hit golf shots and then mentally you're, <laughs> you got to go the, the hurdle of like, God, I can hit it better. I know I could do better. Um, but yeah, so the golf industry was like, I loved, I grew up, uh, I started playing golf when I was like 11, 12 and I loved the game. So I was like, I didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, I didn't know when people said like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I didn't know what that was. You know, I, I wanted to be a lawyer, an architect. I kind of threw out these things because I saw them in movies or, you know, TV shows, but I didn't really know. So I went to college because I love golf. I said, oh, okay, I can be a, a PGA professional. I can get in the golf business. Like my uncle was a PGA professional, owns his own golf course. So I said, okay, maybe that's a route. So I went to college and what is interesting when you, when you do say that about like business and stuff is I didn't take the traditional path that most golf professionals, like they'll go work at what's called like a green grass facility. So think of your golf course, right? They're standing behind the counter. They're maybe running the, the operations there, whatever. I actually decided to be a golf instructor. So in a way I was running my own business. I was an independent contractor, had my, I remember starting on dracogolf.com back in 2006 when I moved to Raleigh, North Carolina and had my own teaching business. But you know, it wasn't, it wasn't um, something I thought of, of like, this is my own business. This is my baby. Like, this is something I'm going to grow. So I'll pause there, but that, yeah, it's kind of interesting, you know, mention that it, it's definitely been more in the, you know, in the thirties, like in the last 10, 12 years where I really started to get that itch of, you know, business could be something that 
takes over my life and actually be focused on running my own business. It's very interesting, the the timeline that you laid out there, because it was right around then. It was, uh, I think, 2012 when I started getting the entrepreneurial itch and, and the idea started forming of how I could serve people at a higher level and have my own thing. You know, I was going through massage therapy school at the time, and my mind was just continually being blown by how the body can heal itself if we just get out of the way and facilitate it to happen versus trying to force it to happen. Yeah. And it just, all of these, these things started accumulating and I started learning new things. And I was like, Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not a dumb guy. Like I'm pretty smart. And if I didn't know that all of this was out there, mm. like, what does the average person not know about natural health? And so that was the impetus for my idea to basically build the Angie's list of natural healthcare providers. Hmm. So I went in and, you know, built my own website, learned how to, you know, write content, learned how to shoot videos, learned how to run Facebook ads, affiliate marketing, all of this stuff. Hmm. But what I was missing was the human connection hmm. out of, out of all of it. That's what I was really missing. I was relying on technology to have this great idea populate throughout the world and without actually getting in front of people and telling them about it and getting them yeah. excited about it. And it was only, you know, looking backwards that I have that, that knowledge, you know, hindsight's 2020, 20, as they say. Um, but that was, that was my journey. And yes, it started just like you, it started later in life. I was in my early thirties when that happened. So it's interesting, the, the synchronicities. Was there a fear there? Like you didn't share it with the world as much. Do you think it was more you're scared to like, because again, maybe like me, like you never really thought that was your avenue. And now all of a sudden you have this. So almost like, well, if I tell people and they don't like it, uh, how does that make me feel? Like, was there any of that? Do you think? You know, I think there probably was a little bit of that it, more in the subconscious, I would say. Um, for me, <clears throat> I, I, I think it was more the fact that I didn't have the value proposition down right and, and able to really generate that excitement. So yeah. the only people that actually ended up enrolling with me were other therapists that I knew, you know, my chiropractor, you know, basically people that I connected with and talked to on a regular basis. Thus the fact that I need to talk to people in order to get this done. Um, so yeah, it was just, uh, really not understanding how to make that connection and, and get people excited about it, which eventually as, you know, more and more of my personal money was leaving the, the checking account to pay for this, it got a little bit demoralizing, to be honest mm. with you. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's part of well, and that's in terms of decisions like people make, I think a lot of folks jump to say, oh, I want to do something new. I want to start a business, but they haven't thought through the plan as much. Now, this partly is, I think, based on age, right? I was at the time, you know, I had, um, I was married back in 2011. I had my first child, my only child. I still, he's 12 now. So you could do the math. I was like, he was, er it was early on. And I'm like, I got a family here. You feel like you can't do those things as much as if you're 22, right? So I think there's some of that as well. It's like where you're at in life, it makes the decisions a little bit more difficult potentially, or you have to have a longer time span where you can do it, which is fine as well. Right, right, a hundred percent. And a lot of it was a lack of education on my end as well. I don't know if you know you've run up against that at all, but um, <clears throat> like you said, I didn't even know the word entrepreneur until that time. I just knew that I had an idea that could be a business and wanted to share it out, but I had no idea how to actually make it work and make it go. How to you know have a business plan, how mm. to put a marketing you know, marketing plan together, how to set a budget, how, you know, all of this stuff. I'm like, yeah, I have no clue. I'm just going to do it because I'm excited. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I learned a lot. I learned a lot of lessons from that and most of it, what not to do, but yeah. some of it also helped me along the way too, as I began to learn what was going on and eventually got into entrepreneurship coaching as well. So, yeah. well, I think, I mean, that's a good point though, is you, at the end of the day, there's no right path. 
Like right. you're not, you and my you know, lives are different. Everyone's different in terms of their upbringing, like friend circles, what they do, their background, all this stuff. So what I found is, okay, so what's similar across folks that have gotten things done? Well, it's putting in the reps, it's consistency. You know, we, we were talking about golf, like the way you get better at golf is through actually going out and practicing and trying to improve. It's like the way you get better at anything. So if someone's like, I, I it's funny you mentioned this because I, I took my son out golfing this morning and he doesn't play much. And he's getting frustrated out there, like missing some shots or like he hit one, he hit, we went to a par three course, but like, so he's hitting driver, you know, 130, 140 yards um, on these par threes. And he misses it like just right at the green. And I'm like, bud, <laughs> You barely play. You just hit this ball like 130 yards. People would love to do that. And just because you're right at the green and you didn't hit it on the green or, or straight at it, you can't get upset at that. You don't play enough. And it's that learning that it's the reps to put in, the more consistency you put in, ultimately you have those tiny incremental improvements, right? And everyone improves at different speeds. But if you're not willing to, like you did, if you're not willing to jump in and try it and start, you have never had the opportunity to grow into anything. It doesn't have to be massive, by the way. And this is why I'm such a big believer in like prototyping, starting small, you know, like little breadcrumbs along the way, ultimately gets you to something bigger versus never doing it at all. So anyways, that, that that's kind of how I think about starting as it is in terms of a business, a hobby, anything. You have to just put the reps in time after time. It's, it's, it's so simple, it's stupid. <laughs> it really is. You're right. You're a hundred percent right. And it, it, whether you're talking about golf or whether you're talking about, you know, martial arts, you have to be able to get those reps in. Like you said, you have to practice. You can't mm -hmm. just, you know, stand and watch a lecture from a golf instructor, or you can't stand and watch a demonstration by your Sifu and then expect that you're going to walk out on that floor and nail it. That's right. just, that's just not how it works. Even though your spirit wants to, that's a good sign. That's a good sign that you have that in you, that your spirit is like, I want this so bad, right. but yeah, like you said, you still got to put in those reps and he should be proud. He didn't he hit it that far, yeah. you know? Like I mean, he's said. out there. He was, he, he's definitely improving, but, and and I, mentally, I think he's getting better. Um, but it's just one of the, I think I went through that when I was young too. And you probably did as well. Like we expect so much, like we expect this perfection, but we realize it actually doesn't exist. It's just the continual effort over time is what refines it. It, it kind of sands it down to smooth out the edges. That That's really what happens. It's just time. Yep. And everybody, everyone, you know, when you do something at first, everybody sucks at it. You know, whatever that, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Driving a car, doing martial arts, playing mm -hmm. golf. What if your first day you're going to suck. Right. And if you want to get good at it, you have to be okay with sucking and keep going. That's just it. Yeah, it like I said, it's so simple, but I think a lot of the times, and I was like this, you know, I only learned this through failing a lot, you know, not doing it or not showing up and then beating myself up. Like, Oh yeah, that's why you didn't get better. You didn't achieve what you wanted because you didn't put the time in. You were lazy, and I had a you know I had a you know some of those moments um, from earlier in life. I had to really catch up to me and think about. But that's ultimately helped me progress over the last half a dozen dozen years because I used that as motivation. I said, okay, this is not the way to do it. There's a better way. Let's go in that direction. So I'm glad that you that you kind of went back to the beginning just a little bit there because that's where I wanted to go is. You, your content, it focuses a lot on fear and pushing through that fear. And, you know, your story obviously ties into that too. And I was wondering what was your fear or, you know, a couple of them maybe that had you stagnated and what did you do to get past it? Well, I, <laughs> when I was playing golf and I, I wasn't playing at a high level, but I was a, a pretty good, darn good player, um, but wasn't like at a tour level or anything like that. I, I remember working with a sports psychologist, uh, Dr. Bob over here in North Carolina. He was in Greensboro. And I remember he said, Brian, you have a fear of success. Not a fear of failure. It was a fear of success. Be and, and again, this goes back to childhood of like being the middle child and like always being in the shadows of my older brother. Um, always like not always feeling like second fiddle. So I would have a hard time rising to the occasion. And a hard time like being the one that's out because I was in the shell. 
So I think that's what ultimately, like he taught me that. And again, it wasn't until many years later where it caught on of like, I could do things that I want to do. And for some reason, for the longest time, as I said earlier, I kind of played small ball. I kind of was like, I'm going to let other people do things. They're better at it. I'm not good enough. Or they got to, maybe I'd make excuse. They got a lucky break or something like that. But I always had this fear of just not being good enough and not thinking that I was the right person to do certain things. And it was a very defeating mentality. Um, I, again, I think it came from childhood. I can't label all the different ways it probably came, but I could tell you that it definitely affected me well into my late twenties, early thirties. I'll even share this and and then, I'll, and then I'll kind of answer, answer the question a little bit deeper, but I wrote my, so I'm publishing my third children's book this October. I wrote my first one when my son was born in 2012. I didn't publish it until it was, it was nine years later, eight years later. Do you know why? Because I said I wasn't a children's book author. Ah, that's for someone else. I'm not a children's book author. Yeah, even though I thought it was a cool story. And I had like, I probably had you know, 60, 70% of it written. I had a good chunk of it written. But I didn't know what to do. I didn't know, okay, who illustrates it? All that. And I didn't, I didn't bother searching because I said, I'm not a children's book author. And I literally put it on the shelf and didn't look at it until 2019. Um, and then it, after getting illustrated and all that, I published it uh, two years later. All that to say, I don't know. I mean, I, I, this may be not the answer you're looking for, but at the time, I don't know what the fear, like in terms of overcoming the fear, I don't, I didn't know how to do that. All I knew was the next step. I wasn't thinking five or 10 years. Like it'd be, it'd be cool if I can sit here and be like, yeah, Brian, I knew like it 10 years, I'm going to be doing this, that, and the other. I didn't know that. But all I knew was that I didn't want to be the Brian of old. I didn't want to be scraping at dollars to be able to pay rent. You know, I didn't want to be able, I didn't want to have these, you know, thoughts of like, wait, I would love to do that and then never do it. Like I said earlier, like never put the time and energy in for certain things that I probably could have been good at or could have really wanted. But it was the simple things. I decided, okay, what am I going to do tomorrow? Let's show up and do it. And this idea really of delayed gratification that it doesn't have to be great tomorrow. But if I can at least do some achievement tomorrow, something small, that could bulldoze its way to the next day and the next day. I don't know what's going to happen in, in a week or a month or a year, but let's just focus on tomorrow. And I had this really like simple mindset of like the next step and not this idea of like this grandiose dreaming and then never doing anything. I don't know if that makes sense. It's, you know, I used to be a dreamer and it was like, oh, let me dream out 10, 15 years and then never do anything. I said, let's just start doing things. And that was really the catalyst that changed. Gotcha. So was it the, was it the children's book that was the catalyst to start doing things? Or was it you started to get interested in entrepreneurship and that was the catalyst that kind of got that going for you? You know, it's a, it was a series of events and okay. I think it was, so let, let, let me kind of go back to one distinct moment. I remember back in the golf industry. And I think this that helps answer the question. I remember when I was working. So during uh, becoming a PGA professional and doing it through college, we had to do internships every summer. Right. So, and I was at a couple private golf clubs on, in some of those summers. And you have some very wealthy individuals, very prominent companies and, and CEOs and stuff. You would recognize their names. Um, and I remember, I, I can't remember the exact day or anything, but I still remember like thinking, I don't want to be the guy that's helping them with their clubs of the car. I don't want to be the guy behind the desk. I want to be the guy playing at the country club. And it was one of the first times, and again, this, you know, you're going back to, I was 20, 21, maybe the first time where I, the first inkling in my head of like, wait a minute, why can't I be that guy? That's the successful businessman or the, the wealthy person or whatever, and not be the guy that's, you know, again, cleaning his golf clubs up after the round. But it wasn't until many years later, what actually took form. I told you the Gary V, you know, thing, my brother started his own business in 2009, which I ended up working for in 2011 for two years. That was a big eye opening. Like, wait, you know, talk about entrepreneurship, like, wait a minute, why can't, why can't I do this? If my, if my brother was able to start a business again, maybe that's something I can do, but I didn't have enough of the, again, it'd be nice to sit here and be like, oh, and then I just took the leap and I did it and I got started. 
Well, <laughs> as we know the story, that didn't happen. Um, it the, the catalyst moment really for me was probably the podcast. I was going to start the podcast in 2015. And I went to this conference and I met this guy that had a podcast called Makers of Sport. And I said, oh man, I, I, I love listening to podcasts. I've always wanted to do mine. I'm going to start one and I'm going to do it this year and I'll let you know how it goes. Well, I saw Adam at the, at the same conference a year later in 2016 and I hadn't started the podcast. So I tell him there, Adam, you know, I'm, this is the year. This is the year I'm going to start it. Well, guess what happened, Brian? What do you think? Uh, so same conference. I'll, I'll bet it wasn't the year. <laughs> same conference in 2017. So we're two years later, and I still hadn't started. So by then, so again, let, let's kind of take the story where it is. I had started to kind of get this inkling of entrepreneurship, wanting to start my own business, right? And I had been had some successful years in sales. I had transitioned from the golf industry to sales at that time. So I started to kind of you know have some more confidence than I ever had. Yes, I shelved the children's book, but there were some other things. Like again, I had some confidence. Like I, I, I was reaching out to folks. I was having conversations. I was learning more about entrepreneurship. I was listening to podcasts. So I had all this kind of crap in my head. And that's what really sparked the Just Get Started podcast, which it's still called today. In 2017, I started it because I said, there's gotta be people just like me that have this fear to start Maybe I could be the one that kind of has, it's like one or two steps forward. And maybe right. I can interview people that have started, that have grown businesses, that have been whatever success is to them, but they've been successful. Um, and and, I, and that's where, and, but again, that's where I kind of grabbed it. This was one of the first moments I remember in most of my life where I grabbed, I said, I'm doing this and I'm going to stick with it. And I started it in um, first episode launch in the end of November, 2017. And you know, here we are, it's like 450 episodes later. Um, I've done solo and in, in, 300 plus interviews and then other solo episodes and, you know, still going strong. So <laughs> it's, that's, that was kind of the moment that really kicked it off for me. Uh, but it, let's, let's go back seven years, right? I was 34. So it's not like I jumped out of high school and said, oh, I'm going to do a podcast or whatever. Like there's some awesome kids, some young podcasters, like people doing that. That wasn't me. It took me a long time to really get the confidence and think I could do it. Yeah, that's a big deal, the confidence thing. I remember when I started making videos for my first business, when I finally had that first one put together, it took me quite a while to hit the uh, upload button oh, or yeah. on YouTube to make it live, man. Because yeah, it, it, all these things in your head, like, am I good enough? What are people going to think of me? What are they going to say? Are they going to call me like an imposter? All, all this stuff that goes through your head. And you know, it took a long time to realize that none of that stuff really matters. Like nothing that anybody else says yeah. really matters if you're coming from a place of service. It just means that those people are not your ideal client. And they're also... Speaking of Gary Vee, I just saw a video before we talked, you know, of him saying that people that spread that kind of hate, they're hurting. They're not in a good place and they're lashing out to make themselves feel better. It doesn't have anything to do with you. Yeah. So I totally understand, uh, you know, what you're, what you're saying and where you're coming from there. Cause yeah, I, I went through it too. And I, I do this podcast to connect with other successful people, hence the name, be successful. Yeah. Other successful entrepreneurs. Hey, how'd you do this? What do you think about this? So yeah. that's why I love these conversations. Um, and you you mentioned the word decision yeah. a few times, which is something I really wanted to key into. Yeah. Um, you know, when people make a decision to do something, oftentimes it could be as frivolous and as fleeting as a New Year's resolution to get back into the gym and get in shape, right? Well, we all know that when, you know, January 15th rolls around, uh, that person, you don't see them around the gym anymore that made that new year's resolution, right. but they still made a decision that they were going to do it. And what I wanted to ask, and this might be a little esoteric, but I wanted to ask you, do you have a way to describe what making a decision feels like when it is the decision that will be the non-negotiable, the one that will catalyst change. 
Do you have a way to describe what that feels like? Describe what it feels like to make a decision. I describe. I don't know. I, I don't know what, what the feeling is. I, I'll tell you what. Maybe this is not the. This is a roundabout way of answering. So tell me if I'm off here. But no, oh, there's no there's no I, right or wrong way to answer this. So you're not yeah. going to be off. I just I want to get your take on this because it's something I've been thinking about recently. Yeah, I, I think for me, it comes back to, well, so th the one thing to kind of wrap a loop around this, I think is important is I think it comes back to control. One thing I've discovered very recently, I, I really went back hard and looked at, you know, as I try to build out the whole, just get started, you know, this mission last handful of years and really try to figure out like, why was, again, why was I fearful? Why was I scared to do stuff? How did I overcome it? And it really comes back to the word control. There's a handful of things in life we have control of, and there's many things we have no control of. So the things that we have control of, we need to take control of and do what we want to do. The other stuff we can't, I, I can't, you know, if something, a car crashed in my you know, house right now, like I can't control that, right? It just is what it is. But I can make a decision, and that's really what control is. So am I making the decisions that are best in line for my life? Or am I making poor decisions? So a lot of times in the past, I was making poor decisions. I was making decisions based on, they were fear-based decisions. They were decisions based off what other people wanted, right? Oh, hey, you know, this group of people are going out tonight. Well, all right, let me go, because I was a people pleaser. Oh, let me go out and hang out with them. Maybe I didn't even like a lot of them, but I was like, I'll go out because it might make them feel better. I wasn't thinking about myself. So the way to get to your answer is control. Because if I can control a situation, I can make a decision to do it or not do it, right? And now all of it comes down to is that decision of do I – is James Clear – I don't know if you know James Clear. He wrote Atomic Habits. Uh, yeah, I, I'm familiar with the book. I haven't read it, but I'm familiar yeah. with it. And I, I love his idea of like it, you're basically making a vote for the person you want to become. Mm. So when I show up, when I do a podcast interview, right, that's in line with the person that I want to become each and every day, right? I want to share the Just Get Started message. I want to interview great people, right? I love having the conversations. Like one, it's all, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and lie. I, I love to put the episode. I love the consistency. I love the fact that I've done it almost seven years because I wasn't a consistent person years ago. And to be able to say that I can do that, like that means a lot to me. Because I've I've literally built that into my life, whether it's CrossFit, we were talking about the Spartan Racer, like all of these things. I'm trained for a marathon now, like all of it. I've put this discipline in my life that I don't think I had when I was younger. So going back, the feeling of making the decision, it's just, it, I don't even think about it because it's what I want to do. And I'm making that decision for what's best for my life. So that might be different for your life or someone listening in. I think the first step is what do you really want to do? And most people don't know that because I sure as hell did it for a lot of years. And if you don't know it, well, what are you going to do? You're going to make decisions that aren't in line with where you want to go in the world. But if you have an idea of like, this is what I want, you're going to have a better chance to make that decision. Yes, That's I absolutely how, agree. I, I almost, maybe maybe the answer in a, the, the very long winded way is I don't put emotion behind it. I already, the decision's already made. Okay. Okay. Now that is, ironically enough, that is kind of in line with what my, my theory around the emotion is. Um, the emotion is just stillness, resoluteness. Because if you think about a decision that you actually made and followed through with that benefited your life and you're happy and proud of where you are now because of that decision... That was obviously a good one. It was the right one, but it was stoic. It was, you felt stoic about it. Like this is not negotiable. This is happening. And none of this stuff that's coming from the outside world is going to change my mind. And yeah, I think you're right. It, it, it's, a, it's a degree of control that helps us get there and kind of filter out what might be the right one might might be the wrong one but if you can 
you know, if you're wondering if you're making the right decision or not, you can just kind of feel in your body, take a minute and be like, okay, I'm going to do this. How does that feel? Does it feel resolute? Does it feel solid? Or does it feel like I might flake out on it? And if it feels like you might flake out on it, you might want to reevaluate. I mean, what do you think? Well, and also, one, this, will go, this goes back to, again, knowing what you want. If you, if you know what you want, you might feel, remember, think about the first time doing something. You're nervous. You're maybe, ah, I don't feel like I fit. We have this imposter syndrome. So at the end of the day, you might be taking a leap of faith on some of this stuff. But that that's in line with knowing where you want to go. And by the way, we don't know what's going to happen. I don't know the outcome. I, it would be nice to say, I know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't, no one does, but I know I, I always like fitness always becomes the simple barometer, like in any of these conversations, because everyone can relate to it. Right. So if, if you're sitting there and you're like, all right, I want to lose 50 pounds. There's a lot of different ways to lose 50 pounds potentially. Right. Right. So now you have to decide again, what's that vote you want to make each day? Like, do I, do I want to go work out? you know, at a CrossFit gym? Do I want to run? Do I want to just walk around the block? What type of food do I want to eat? How do I want to eat? Do I want to do intermittent fasting? Do I want to just do a vegetarian diet? Like there's so many different ways you can do it, but you know, what's consistent with all of those consistency. <laughs> you're right. doing it every day. You're doing something right. You're again, you're signing up for it. And, and the decision you're making is I want to become this healthier human being. And eventually, you know what happens? I, Simon Sinek, just, I, I listened to a, a recent podcast with him. And I love how he talks about where like, I can't tell you when the 50 pound is going to be off. I can just tell you that you will probably get there eventually if you keep moving forward and you keep doing it. So it's that, it, the, that's why the decision is mo emotionless. It's the, that's the person I want to be well into the future. Now I just got to do the little thing today. No one's asking anyone to run a marathon tomorrow. I just want you to walk around the block, right? Or do some push-ups, or eat, you know, eat healthier food versus you know take take the snacks out of the pantry. Whatever it is, it's it's actually very very small. It's very micro. A lot of these decisions, but they add up. Just like how, how many episodes of your podcast have you done? Uh, I think we're up to I don't know sixty something right now. Oh, wow. Oh, congrats, man. That's awesome. Because most Thank people you. stop after, you know, probably six um, episodes, but it's that the whole thing of like, you keep churning them out. You keep putting them out. You keep doing the things you want to do. Like the blog articles, as an example, I've, I, I think it's been, I look in recent, I think it's been four years now, three times a week, I publish a blog article for the last four years. You can do the math on how many that is, right? And it's just because I love to write but I make it a practice to write the articles, to put them out. I basically publish a month in advance. So like all the Julys are already written and already scheduled to go out. And then I'll plan August and mid to late July. You know what I'm saying? But like, it's, so it goes back to, this is a l way longer discussion. So it's, hopefully it's okay that I went in this rant. No, I love it, man. I'm glad, I'm glad we're here. That's, that's the beauty of these conversations. You don't know exactly where they're going to go. And I truly believe that whoever is meant to hear it will hear it and they'll be served. So yeah. that's let's, good. let's that? go. Well, so let's go one, you mentioned the new year's resolutions. I think that's a great point. Why do new year's resolutions fail and some succeed? It's systems. It's putting or it's putting boundaries around what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. And it's sticking consistent with those, right? Like if someone was working and they had a business meeting with their manager every day at 10 a.m., I guarantee they're showing up to that meeting every day at 10 a.m. Without, right. they're not missing that. So why are they missing date nights with their spouse? Why are they not showing up at their kid's baseball game? Why are they not doing the gym? It's the same thing. So it goes back to like, are you putting the boundaries in place? I'm going to schedule that on my calendar, or this is important. This is a priority to me. So I'm going to make this a point. And that, again, it leads to an emotionless decision because I've already made the decision. This is important in my life. I'm going to do it. And the other stuff doesn't matter. So that right. that's kind of how I think about it. And, and by the way, it didn't just happen overnight. This is something I've been ruminating on for years. 
And slowly and surely that those little decisions, those little micro movements forward have added up to really you know, last five, six years, this massive change. The Brian of five, six years ago was a totally different human being, totally different human being. I had a lot of the same foundational stuff probably, but just a totally different human being of how I perform, how I make decisions, how I do things in life, what my goals are, all this, all because I decided to make a big decision many years ago to go a different direction than my life was leading. So that's kind of how I think about it in a nutshell. Yeah, that is that is great feedback. That is a very good analogy. And I'm glad that we went down that rabbit hole because again, I, I truly believe that there is people out there that watch this show that needed to hear that message and and just really understand that it's not just you, it's not just me or them that's going through it. Like we all go through it in different capacities. And I love that you use the word priorities because that's really what it comes down to is oh. the reason yet they're not going on date nights. The reason you're not, you know, at the kids ball game is because it's really hard to say, and it might be hard to hear it, but the reason you're not going is because it's not a priority to you. And if you really want to fix it, then you know what you got to do. Right. It, you know, think about it. Like, I don't know if you have any friends or family members, but they get diagnosed with, with like a, a disease, you know, something, something that's like life threatening, you know, they have a heart attack, something like that. And all of a sudden they change their life. Cause it's like, you know, death is hitting them at the, at the door. Yes. And it's like, I, I just, I look at it from a standpoint of I'm trying to push off and I can't control that. I don't know what's going to happen as we talked about. Right. But no idea, but I'm going to try to push that back as far. That's why I'm really keen on my health. And I work out consistently and I try to eat very healthy. It's because, and I, you know, sleep's so important to me because I want to push back that I don't want to be in a hospital. Yes. If I, could, if I could, if I could handle it, if I can control it. Now, again, sometimes I can't control that, but I don't, I don't want to get to the point where it's like, Brian, you literally need to do this or who knows what's going to happen with your life. I want to have the control versus putting the control in someone else's hands. And that's why I think a lot of people, that's that's why you always hear like a lot of people change their life when they hit rock bottom, mm -hmm. whatever rock bottom is. Because it's like, I, I'm either gonna like die or be in like the, the most suffering I've ever been, or I'm gonna change my life and do it better. And that's why a lot of people have that curve. That's what happened to me. I mean, I kind of hit, I don't know if it was rock bottom, but it felt <laughs> damn near low of just how I was feeling mentally. And I had to make that change. I think a lot of people go through that, right? I think they get to that point. Yep. I, I've been through everything you just said right there. You know, rock bottom, having a friend whose mortality hit hit them in the face and it came very quickly at the end. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough thing to understand uh, if you haven't gone through it, but it really does make you appreciate uh, the time that we do have and what we can, like you said, what we can control and put in place. Um, thinking about control and going back to, you know, what it is that you do to help people. Um, you're in the sales business, the sales training world, and you're coming out with a new sales training system, right? And I'm wondering what you think is missing from all these other tr sales training systems that are out there because there's a lot of them. Yeah. So what do you find that's missing that made you step up and say, I need to do this because? Well, for there was two, let's, let's two avenues really. One is because, and I've been in software sales for a lot of years. And typically, have you ever had sales training, by the way? I have. You're, okay. So, you know, like someone comes in and they talk and they, they to a, a big group, maybe they share some methodology, maybe they're, you know, some, you know, tactic or whatever, but there's no substance to it. And typically a lot of those, you know, 80, 85% of the stuff you learn goes out the wayside a couple of weeks later. A lot of it's wasted. And what I learned at least, and, and trying to be, you know, keen to what's going on in the organizations that I've been in is that there's so many different skill sets of these sales reps, right? You have some that are fresh, you know, first time in, maybe their first couple months in a role. You have some that are extremely seasoned. Some sell one way, some sell another. You can't give a blanket sales training to them, but that's how most sales training companies are. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a blanket training. 
they try to hit it hard. Maybe there's some advancement and then they leave and they get out of the way. And then most people fall back, right? Because people leave, whatever. So what I really found, because I love entrepreneurship, I love, I have a lot of friends that are founders of companies and I love, <laughs> I don't love their struggle, but I love that they have this idea of wanting to grow something. But what I found is most of them have no idea how to sell. So that's why I really focused on the B2B founders and their teams to say, all right, if I have someone that's starting a tech company and trying to grow a business, but has zero idea how to sell, well, how are they going to continue to sustain the business? How are they maybe going to get outside funding from VCs, right? How are they going to actually grow if they don't have sustainable revenue? So I felt I can go in and really improve that individual because I believe it's human to human. Mm, I believe truly. any. Any, anyone can be a great sales professional when you realize there's not a tactic. There's not that this, you know, the stigma of sales has always been the used car salesman, the snake oil salesman, right? That, that type of thing. There's always been this thing of like, there's some sleazy, you know, whatever. That's the, when I got into sales initially, I didn't, I almost didn't take the job because I was like, do I really want to get to sales full time? Cause I had the old stigma, right? You know, right. Like, Yes, I know exactly what you mean, you know, it, because it, the sales training that I took, it was, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Dan Locke, but I went through his high ticket closer training Okay. and yeah, all of those same fears came up, you know, oh, I don't want to be sleazy or come across salesy and just have people turn their nose up at me and I'm always trying to sell them something. Yeah. yeah all of those stigmas were, were there for quite a few of the students that went through. Yep. Yeah. And so what I really found, and again, this is just being observant. And I don't know if this, I mean, maybe luckily, right, goes back to like the golf business when I was teaching golf. Like I had to be keen on what my students were doing. I had to observe them. I had to make um, advancements to their game or try to help them make advancements. I had to, as I, you know, you learn what not to say and what to say. Like all these things are kind of like learning. So I did that when I was in the sales world. I started to follow along. All right, let me find the best sales reps. And let me see what they're doing. Because I wasn't good. So the best sales reps, what are they doing? They got to be doing something special. You know what? They weren't doing anything special. You know what they were doing? They were being themselves. Mm -hmm. They were listening. They were communicating properly. That's they a, were doing yeah. the simple things, right? Yeah. Following up, writing a professional email, asking questions. Like it's the simplest stuff. <laughs> Dude, you're, you're hitting like so many points right now that, yeah, it's so simple, but so few people do it. Um, I work right now, I work at an IMO, so and I'm actually a marketer. I'm reaching out to people, trying mm -hmm. to encourage them to come over to our company and write with us. And yeah. the people that I have converted, it's because I am who I am. I'm not pushy. I do follow up and I do show that person that I actually give a crap about you and your life. And I can't tell you how many times I've been told that by other agents. And that's the reason they come over. It, yeah. It's, you know, if you're in sales, guys, like this is really what it is. Yeah. I'm so glad we're touching on this. Now, there, there's obviously, so I, I break it down into skills and systems, right? So that's, I've simplified it. Because again, a founder, they might be a tech founder and you know they know how to develop software, but they have no idea how to sell their product. Mm. So there's a systems to like, how do you set up proper calls? Like how do you structure, right? There, there's certainly things like, how do you write a proposal? How do you make it so it's not so complex, right? I'm going through this right now with uh, someone I'm working with where you know he's he put together this proposal and I was listening to some of his calls and I'm like, Man, I was like, this is so hard to understand. So we literally simplified his proposal. It's now at like a nice little table. It's very easy to see the numbers. You kind of take all the fluff away and the conversation flows so much smoothly. The potential client can actually understand what they're buying and what the costs are and stuff. So just stuff like that. So there's some systems in play. And then there's certainly skills. It's like anything else. Like we're talking golf or martial arts, all these things. There's skills that you have to learn like learning when to ask the right questions, learning how to communicate, right? Simple stuff, but they are skills that you have to learn. So I found that if you can build the best skills and you can build systems in play, and then you let the human element take over who you are as a person, you can, anyone can sell. 
And that's what gets missed a lot with sales training. So looping back to your initial question, what gets is people try to think, oh, I have to be like them. And they forget that if I'm just like me and I just become better in certain areas, I could sell these products or I can sell this service or whatever it ends up being, right? That's that's the gist of it. So that's what I wanted to, I wanted to kind of go out and solve is B2B founders, they, they're out there just in the cold. They have no idea how to sell and they're trying to bring in revenue, sustain their business, maybe to pay their rent. Well, they can't afford these massive sales training company costs, nor do they want to because it's going to be a wasted effort. So I said, there's got to be a way. So I created it. So I gotcha. I gotcha. And there, there it is. That's the entrepreneurial way right there. You saw a need, you saw an opportunity and you're here to fill that gap. And that's, yeah. that's what we're all about. Hey, Brian, can I say one thing? Cause I think it's helpful to folks maybe trying to get started. Please. It sounds nice, but I was going to do this two years ago. So going back to the podcast, remember I, you know, I, yep. Two years ago, I was going to start you know, doing sales mentorship and I, I did some, I put some online courses out there and I try, I kind of started and then I, I fell back into kind of a little old way where I was like, do I really want to do sales training? Do I really want to go down this path? Like, is this what I really want to do? And I kind of got stuck for a while where I paused it for like six or eight months. But I went back to kind of what you're talking about serving. What I went back to, what are my core principles? What do I really, well, the sales mentorship stuff is just like my just get started. I mean, it's under my just get started umbrella, but it's the same mission. It's helping people take control. It's helping people have a more fulfilling life. I'm just doing it with my skill set of sales and teaching people and coaching people how to do that. It's, it's similar. So once I was able to grasp that, it was a lot easier to say, okay, this is a path to go down to kind of build this out. So just to be clear, it's not, it wasn't just a, oh, I'm going to do this part, whatever. Like there was that fear, that uncertainty was there, right? I doubted myself if I was good enough even. And then I had to build the confidence back up. And it's, you know, it's a continual story. It's a continual process, right? And I'm super glad that you said that and made that point because if you didn't, I was going to drive it home. So yeah, I absolutely agree. You know, if, you're going to have those moments where you fall back into mm -hmm. old ways of thinking, old patterns. But, you know, to that point, the only way that you fail is if you quit. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yep. A hundred percent. Well, Brian, this has been an amazing conversation. I have so enjoyed connecting with you and the value that you have shared, the stories here. I know it's going to help a lot of people. I'm going to put your website down below. So guys, click on his website. If you want to connect with Brian, get into his world, see all the ways that he could help you gain control and up-level your life. And I'm going to give you the floor here, sir. If you have anything you want to end with, close with anything we missed, the floor is yours. I, I just appreciate the opportunity just to have me on chat. You know, it's always fun chatting about this stuff. And and I, and I guarantee it's similar to you, right? I'm going to go back, you know, an hour is going to go by and be like, oh man, that was a good idea. Or, oh, that's an interesting thought. I love this. The conversation is so important. And that's what I encourage folks. If you're listening in, like reach out to me on LinkedIn or on my website, fill a contact form. I love to have like virtual coffees with folks. I love to have conversations and just meet new people. Because I find the more people you meet, the more ideas start surfacing and it's a benefit for both people. So that's that's my encouragement. Reach out on LinkedIn, say hello, do it on my website, whatever's easier for you and uh, look forward to connecting with folks. Absolutely. And guys, as you can see, Brian is a super nice and approachable person. So when he says connect with him, he means it. So if you're interested and want to connect, see where you can go together, reach out. And again, that website link will be below. Brian, again, man, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure having you here. Thanks, Brian. You bet. All right, guys, you know what to do. Share the show, like the show, share it out with your whole network. You never know who, whose life you can touch by a simple share and who needs to hear this message. Peace. We'll see you in the next one.